two minutes and 14 seconds after the first seismic event, a second event measuring 4.2 on the Richter scale, 250 times larger than the first, registers on seismographs across Northern Europe and is detected as far away as Alaska. This second explosion is equivalent to almost three tons of TNT. The first event is a chemical reaction, but it's not the last chemical reaction to take the lives of sailors in Kursk. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on them later. K141 is a Project 949 A-class anti-submarine of the Oscar class. Its NATO reporting name is Oscar II. It's the second last submarine of the Oscar II class designed and built in the Soviet Union. Construction begins in 1990 at the Soviet Navy shipyard in Sedvodvinsk near Arkhangelsk in the Northern Russian SFSR or Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. The SFSR is the largest of the 15 republics of the Soviet Union. During the construction of K141, the Soviet Union collapses but work continues and it becomes one of the first naval vessels completed after the collapse. In 1993, K141 is named Kursk, on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Kursk. Kursk is completed and launched in 1994. It's commissioned by the Russian Navy on the 30th of December as part of the Russian Northern Fleet. Kursk is assigned to its home port of Vidyayevo in Murmansk Oblast. The anti-design is the pinnacle of Soviet nuclear submarine technology. They're the second largest cruise missile submarines ever built after some Ohio-class submarines. It's built to defeat an entire US aircraft carrier group consisting of one aircraft carrier, one guided missile cruiser, two warships and two frigates. A single Type 65 torpedo carries a 450 kilogram warhead, powerful enough to sink an aircraft carrier. Both missiles and torpedoes can be equipped with nuclear warheads. The Kursk is 9.1 meters longer than the preceding Oscar I class of submarines. Senior officers have individual staterooms and the crew have a gymnasium. The outer hull is made of stainless steel, 8.5 millimeters thick. It's high in nickel chromium, which has exceptionally good resistance to corrosion and a weak magnetic signature. This helps prevent detection by US magnetic anomaly detector systems. A 200 mm gap separates the outer hull and the 50.8 mm thick steel pressure hull. The Kursk measures 154 meters bow to stern, 18.2 meters on the beam and draws nine meters from the hull to the sail. It's rated to dive to a depth of 600 meters and can remain submerged for up to 120 days. The sail superstructure is reinforced to allow it to break through the Arctic ice. The Kursk is armed with 24 cruise granite missiles with eight torpedo tubes in the bow. The granite missiles have a range of 340 miles and are capable of supersonic flight at an altitude over 12 miles high. They're designed to swarm enemy vessels and intelligently choose individual targets, terminating in a dive onto the target. The torpedo tubes can be used to launch either torpedoes or its 18 Stallion anti-ship missiles with a range of 31 miles. Kursk is part of Russia's northern fleet, which has suffered financial cutbacks throughout the 1990s. It's one of the few submarines in the northern fleet that isn't at anchor rusting away in Zapanaya Litsa naval base, 62 miles from Murmansk. Only the most essential frontline equipment like search and rescue vessels have been maintained. Even the fleet's sailors aren't paid in the mid-1990s. In 1998, Kursk is refitted to carry HTP torpedoes. HTP, or high test peroxide, is a concentrated hydrogen peroxide which, in combination with kerosene, is cheaper to produce than other torpedo fuels. This is a much needed cost saving exercise at a time when the Navy can barely afford to pay their sailors and they have a stockpile of HTP torpedoes. Four torpedoes are available from a batch of 10 manufactured in 1990. Six of the 10 are rejected because of faulty welds. But since the torpedoes are only intended to carry dummy warheads, the weld inspections aren't extensive. This decision is opposed by some experts in the Navy because HTP is not as stable as other fuels 
and other navies have discontinued HTP torpedoes. On the 11th of August 2000, the Russian Navy is getting ready for a training exercise. Summer X is the first large-scale naval exercise in the Russian Navy for more than a decade. The first since the fall of the Soviet Union. 30 ships and 3 submarines are taking part in the exercise. At Vidyayevo Naval Base, preparations are hurriedly underway for Kursk and its crew. The four HTP torpedoes are brought out of storage to be loaded onto the submarine. During the hive of activity, a torpedo is dropped. There doesn't seem to be any damage, although there is some HTP present around the seal. The men report the incident and the presence of HTP, then continue their work of loading Kursk with dummy warheads and provisions. The dummy torpedo is more than a decade old and some components have exceeded their lifespan. On the morning of the 12th of August 2000, Kursk is in the Barents Sea. At 0851, Kursk requests permission to conduct a torpedo training launch and receives confirmation. Kursk dives to its launch depth at 20 meters and monitors the surface through its periscope. The launch crew pass through the control center in compartment 2 and enter compartment 1 at the bow of the submarine. They enter the compartment, close the bulkhead hatch behind them and seal it. There's an air duct between the first and second compartments. The same air duct extends through all nine watertight compartments in the submarine. Best practice is to seal the duct like the bulkhead hatch, but the sailors leave the hatch open. When a torpedo is launched, it creates a high pressure wave inside the first compartment. Leaving the duct hatch open helps to dampen the pressure wave created from the torpedo launch. It's been almost three years since the crew have fired a torpedo. They haven't had training on handling and launching an HTP torpedo. They take out the operations manual so they can refer to any procedures they don't know. The crew should inspect the torpedoes before loading them into their launch silo. But this is a big exercise and there's a lot to do to prepare for launch. They take the 5-ton torpedo out of storage and wheel it to the launch tube. They slide it into the tube and close the launch tube door behind it. The torpedo launch tube is designed to direct the blast outwards towards the sea rather than into the boat. In fact, the torpedo loading door is three times stronger than the external door. The sailors turn to the operations manual to read through the launch sequence. At 11.25, it's been more than two and a half hours preparing for launch when they finally initiate the launch sequence. Kursk will launch this practice torpedo towards the Kirov class battlecruiser Piotr Veliki. It's a Type 65 kit torpedo nicknamed Toltushka or Fat Girl for its formidable girth. Even without the warhead attached, it weighs 5 tons and is 10.7 meters long. Fat Girl is successfully loaded into number 4 torpedo on the starboard or right side of the sub. Electrical connectors on the inner torpedo tube door have to make contact with the connections on the back of the torpedo. The last time the crew of Kursk fired a torpedo was three years ago, so they're a little rusty, both the crew and possibly the connectors. The system doesn't show a positive connection, so they reopen the door to clean the connections. Although HTP is normally stable when sealed, if it comes into contact with a catalyst, it expands 5,000 times in volume and acts as an oxidizer through a chemical reaction. That chemical reaction is exothermic, which means it generates energy or heat. In fact, that's precisely what it's designed to do. For a fire to burn, it needs three things, oxygen, fuel, and heat. A torpedo doesn't have access to oxygen underwater, so the HTP provides both oxygen and heat to the kerosene fuel. Once the chemical reaction begins, it burns until the HTP is exhausted. A catalyst for HTP is bronze and brass, like the metal used to line the torpedo launch tube in Kursk. Now, the small leak of HTP from a faulty weld or from being dropped during loading, this same leak that isn't picked up in a pre-launch inspection comes into contact with the torpedo launch tube. The one ton of HTP in the torpedo begins reacting and causes the kerosene fuel tank in the torpedo to fail. Half a ton of kerosene ignites alongside the HTP that's rapidly expanding in an explosion that burns at almost 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. With the launch tube door open, the explosion is directed into the sub instead of out to sea. The seven crew members in the torpedo room don't stand a chance. 
The enormous blast wave along with smoke and fire pushes through the open air ducts into the second, third, fourth and fifth watertight compartments. The partially open torpedo door is blown off its hinges. The command center in compartment two is engulfed in flames. Despite being at periscope depth, there's no time for anyone to react. The open air duct bulkhead doesn't compartmentalize the initial explosion. All 36 crew in control of Kursk are killed along with the torpedo launch crew. At 11.29 and 34 seconds, Norwegian seismic detectors that are part of the array known as NORSAR are the first to pick up a notable event. Other detectors further afield also register a hit that would rate as a magnitude of 1.5 on the Richter scale. The location of this event is pinpointed at 69 degrees 38 north, 37 degrees 19 east, northeast of Murmansk, approximately 160 miles from Norway and 50 miles from the Kola Peninsula. These are the last known coordinates of Kursk. Two minutes and 14 seconds after the first incident, a second, much larger event is detected. This time it registers 4.2 on the Richter scale and is 250 times larger than the first detection, an explosion equivalent to almost three tons of TNT. When the coordinates are triangulated, the depth of the second event is equivalent to the seabed an additional 108 meters deeper than the first incident. These seismic events are detected by other vessels in Summer X, but they assume it's part of the training exercise. The fire from the first explosion detonates up to seven torpedoes with live warheads, weighing almost half a ton each. This second explosion completely collapses the first three compartments and rips a hole in the submarine's hull, letting water into compartment four. Sailors in the third, fourth and fifth compartments are killed by the explosion. Two of the sailors in the nuclear reactor room in compartment four are thrown violently by the blast across the compartment. Their bones are shattered and bodies twisted by the 50 G force equivalent to a high speed car crash. The body count is already up to 95 men. In the vessel's fifth compartment protected by the strongest bulkheads are two nuclear reactors. These bulkheads can withstand the same pressure as the external hull. There's also 13 centimeters of steel encasing them and they're mounted to withstand shocks up to 50 G. The two reactors survive the explosions and shut down in a controlled manner, avoiding a nuclear disaster. The reinforced fifth compartment also contains black box equipment that records the activity on the boat. The protocol is to have the black box operational while at sea, but the only thing it records is the black box being shut down earlier in the day. When submarines are underwater, all hatches are closed to segment one watertight compartment from another. Men in compartments towards the stern of Kursk seal off air duct hatches and assess their next move. Normally during an incident, sailors in the rear compartments move forward to the third compartment where they enter an escape capsule in the conning tower or sail. If that's not possible, there's an escape trunk in the first compartment. The explosion has destroyed the first compartment and flooded the third compartment. 24 men are assigned to compartments six through nine towards the rear of the boat. 23 survive the two blasts and gather in a small ninth compartment which also has an escape hatch. Emergency lighting is normally powered by batteries located in the first compartment which has been destroyed. The ninth compartment has its own emergency lights. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kalishnikov, head of the turbine unit in the seventh department, is one of three surviving officers of the same rank. Kalishnikov writes two notes at 1315, one hour and 45 minutes after the second explosion. On one side of a piece of paper, he writes a private note to his family. On the reverse side, he outlines the situation and the names of the sailors in the ninth compartment. There's still enough light and he writes, Время 13.15. All personnel from sections 6, 7 and 8 have moved to section 9. 23 people are here. We feel bad, weakened by carbon dioxide. Pressure is increasing in the compartment. If we head for the surface, we might not survive the compression. We won't last more than a day. We've made the decision because none of us can escape. Lieutenant Commander Rashid Ayapov from the sixth compartment also writes a note on a page in a detective novel. He explains that the explosion was caused by faults in the torpedo compartment. 
namely the explosion of a torpedo on which the Kursk had to carry out tests. The submarine was tossed violently about, and many crew members were injured by equipment that tore loose in the explosion. He tears out the page, wraps it in plastic, and puts it in his pocket. When I started using Brilliance, I went directly to a specific course to learn about buoyancy and pressure, which are important themes in these videos. Then I realized I was missing certain foundations in my calculations. Luckily, Brilliance have already thought of that and created learning paths that guide you step by step. I wasn't particularly academic in school and in my adult life, I realized how much I missed out on. What I like about Brilliant is that I get to go back and learn the things that I missed. The things I dismissed in school as boring subjects I'll never use are the same things I now find most interesting. You just log in and find the particular stream you like and Brilliant will guide you from start to finish. To try Brilliant free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash waterline stories or click the link in the description. The first 200 subscribers will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Kursk is expected to resurface and make contact at 1330. This time passes and no one is immediately concerned. It's not unusual for communication equipment to fail, it's relatively common. Fleet Commander Admiral Popov dispatches a helicopter from battleship Pyotr Veliki to search for Kursk at her expected resurfacing location. The Northern Fleet Duty Officer notifies the officer in charge of the fleet's search and rescue force, Captain Tislenko, to stand by for orders. On top of compartment 7 of Kursk, there's an emergency rescue buoy. The buoy is designed to automatically deploy in an emergency situation such as fire or rapid pressure change. As it's deployed, it rises to the surface so that rescuers can locate Kursk. In 1999, while on active duty, it's disabled in order to avoid possible detection and never turn back on. In the ninth compartment, the men now face a daunting decision. There's an escape hatch which they can open and swim to the surface. They have rescue hoods which will give them enough air to swim the 100 meters to the surface. The explosion has twisted the hull of the ship. The watertight bulkhead hatch is leaking and compartment 9 is slowly filling with water. As it fills, the air pocket inside the compartment is compressed. Right now, the air is still almost the same pressure as the surface. This means that if they open the hatch right away, the risk of decompression sickness is low. The longer they wait, the more water fills the compartment, increasing the pressure. This also means as time passes, they're breathing air under higher pressure, so their body starts to absorb nitrogen. If they wait too long to open the hatch and ascend, they will get decompression sickness when they swim for the surface. They know there are rescue ships in the area, so they'll probably get picked up at some point. But it's not a simple decision to make. As soon as they open the hatch, they'll seal their fate. The airlock compartment could be flooded, so when they open the hatch, it would completely flood the ninth compartment. If the injured sailors make it out of the hatch and are able to swim to the surface, the water in the Bering Sea is freezing. They might survive for an hour at most. Finding people in the ocean is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. On the other hand, the nuclear reactors power the air purification and heating system, which is now shut down. The air in the ninth compartment is slowly filling with carbon dioxide and the temperature is dropping. It's an almost impossible decision to make. Swim for the surface, forcing your injured colleagues to fight for the last hour of their life, or stay put and hope that rescue reaches you before the compartment floods with water or carbon dioxide. For now, the sailors have emergency rebreathers. As the men exhale, the carbon dioxide and water vapor in their breath causes a reaction in the chemical. The potassium superoxide absorbs the carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. After the chemical reaction takes place, the potassium superoxide is spent and the cartridges need to be replaced. The men have limited supply of cartridges, however, they decide to wait for rescue. The primary rescue ship at Tezlenko's disposal is the Mikhail Rudnitsky, a 20-year-old former lumber carrier. The Mikhail Rudnitsky is equipped with an AS-32 and an AS-34 Pritz-class rescue submersible, a diving bell, underwater cameras, and cranes. The vessel is not equipped with stabilizers to maintain position during heavy weather. This means she can only lower these deep submergence rescue vehicles in calm seas. 
Kalashnikov writes a second note at 15:15, about four hours after the explosion. Свет уже погас. It's dark in here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there is no chance. 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will hopefully get out. Regards to everybody, no need to despair. Kolesnikov. At 1700, an illusion aircraft is dispatched but doesn't locate Kursk despite searching for three hours. By 1800, more than six hours have passed since the explosion and Kursk misses a further communication check. The Northern Fleet Command tries to contact the submarine. At 1830, they begin a search and rescue operation and send additional aircraft to search for Kursk without success. At 2230, an emergency is declared by the Northern Fleet and the training exercise is abandoned. All nearby available assets join the search, 3,000 sailors and more than 15 vessels. At 0030, the Mikhail Rudnitsky, Russia's salvage ship, leaves port. At Vidyayevo naval base, rumors are starting to circulate among the family members of Kursk's crew. News is filtering back that a boat is in trouble and the name begins to spread. Because of her reputation as being unsinkable, the sailors' families try to disregard the worst scenarios, choosing to believe there are simply communication issues. The deputy base commander assures family members that officers arriving in the headquarters are just passing the time. Inside the submarine, the men's rebreather cartridges are starting to run low. Captain Lieutenant Kalashnikov and two others start to exchange cartridges in the rebreather system. The compartment is still filling slowly with water and it's pitch black. One of the men loses his balance, plunging into the icy water with a potassium superoxide cartridge. Potassium superoxide is as reactive as the hydrogen peroxide that caused the first explosion. Water vapor in the air creates a small controlled reaction. When the cartridge submerges under the oily water, it triggers a chemical explosion and flash fire, etching a burn mark into the walls of the compartment above the waterline. Kalashnikov's abdomen is burned by acid, exposing his internal organs. The flesh on his head and neck is stripped away by the explosion. The other men dive under the water to escape the flames and chemicals burning their skin. In order for humans to survive, they need to breathe at least 19.5% oxygen. The flame is over in a flash, but when the men come up for air, the oxygen in the air has been consumed by the fire. The chemical reaction designed to give them life has now taken it away. By 0450, back on Pietro Veliki, two anomalies are detected on the seabed that might be the missing vessel. Mikhail Rudnitsky arrives on location at 0900. While setting anchor, her crew intercepts an acoustic sound, possibly an SOS signal from the sub. But they disregard this as the anchor chain striking the anchor locker. At 11.30, Mikhail Rudnitsky begins preparations to lower the AS-34 submersible. Six hours later, at 17.30, it's in the water. At 18.30, the AS-34 collides with an object 100 meters below the waterline while traveling at a speed of two knots. Through a porthole window, the crew can see they've hit the Kursk's propeller and stern stabilizer. The AS-34 sustains some damage and is forced to resurface. Its sister submersible, the AS-32, is prepared for launch on the Mikhail Rudnitsky and it goes into the water at 2240. They're given incorrect headings by the Piotr Veliki, so they don't locate the submarine. They report picking up an acoustic SOS to the Piotr Veliki, but it's determined to be of a biological origin. At 0100 on Monday the 14th of August, the AS-32 is back at the surface. During the morning, the salvage tug Nikolai Shaika SB-131 manages to obtain the first images of the wrecked submarine. Using deep water camera equipment, it shows severe damage from the sub's bow to its stern. Kursk is listing at a 25 degree angle and down between 5 and 7 degrees at the bow. The bow has plowed into the clay seabed for around 22 meters at a depth of 108 meters. They also report that the periscope is raised. This shows that the incident must have happened with the submarine at a depth of 20 meters or less. At 0500, AS-34 is repaired and returns to the water. They find Kursk at 0650, try to attach to the aft escape hatch, but fail. The crew are forced to surface after their batteries run low. 
they have to wait for the batteries to recharge. While the batteries are charging, the weather picks up, with wind gusting up to 52 knots and a sea state up to 2.4 meters, the rescue operation is suspended. Now an official announcement is made. The media are told that Kursk had minor technical difficulties and descended to the ocean floor. They claim to have contacted the crew and are actively providing services to them like air and power. They also assure the press and the sailors' families that everyone on board is alive. Vladimir Kuryadov, the fleet's admiral, explains that the cause of the accident is that Kursk has collided with a NATO submarine. The next day, Tuesday the 15th of August, weather conditions at the wreck's location deteriorate significantly. There's limited visibility, the weather is poor, undersea currents are rising and the waves are getting up to 3 meters. Rescuers launch a diving bell twice but fail to connect to the sub. They try to attach to the rescue hatch of Kursk with an ROV but that doesn't work either. At 2000, while launching the AS-34 submersible, it strikes a crane boom. After some minor repairs, it's successfully launched at 2110. A crane ship, PK-7500, arrives with a DSRV, or Deep Submergent Search and Rescue Vehicle, Project 18270 Best of Class. Project 18270 DSRV is a manned rescue craft designed to carry out search and rescue operations like saving the crew of a distressed submarine at depths up to 800 meters. It can dock with a wrecked submarine and take a maximum of 18 survivors on board. Weather conditions prevent the PK-7500 from lowering the submersible into the water. The captain decides to sail closer to shore, deploy the DSRV, then tow it on site. Shortly after midnight on Wednesday the 16th, the AS-34 tries and fails another two times to attach to the escape hatch on Kursk. While being recovered, it's badly damaged. Parts of AS-32 are used to make emergency repairs. PK-7500 returns to the scene of the wreck with its DSRV under tow. They attempt to rescue but can't connect to the escape hatch. A rescue capsule is damaged when it slams into Kursk. At 1200 on Thursday the 17th of August, Fleet Commander Admiral Popov reports that despite the NATO submarine hitting the Kursk, no explosion has taken place and Kursk is still intact on the sea floor. He claims that the external influence caused a leak between the first and second compartments. Another attempt is made by the DSRV to connect to the escape hatch but doesn't succeed. Altay, a rescue ship, attempts to attach a diving bell to Kursk and also fails. A statement from Russian Navy headquarters in Moscow claims that rescuers have heard Morse code being tapped out on Kursk's hull. On the 17th of August, Vladimir Putin finally accepts the offers from both Norwegian and British governments for assistance. On the 18th of August, multiple diving squads are on the scene. Russian divers, as part of the Navy's search and rescue branch, are present alongside six teams of Norwegian and British divers. On the 19th of August, a full week after the sinking, a Norwegian vessel arrives carrying a British LR5 rescue submarine. On the 20th of August, an ROV is launched from the Norwegian vessel to the submarine. They discover that the front section of Kursk, nearly 18 meters of it, is completely wrecked. Despite Russia accepting foreign aid, there are still limitations on the Norwegian divers. They are permitted to only work on the same escape hatch that the submersibles are trying to connect to, the one in the ninth compartment towards the stern. They are also allowed to operate the air control valve on the rescue trunk. In their briefing, they are told this valve opens anti-clockwise. If they try to turn it clockwise, it will break, rendering it useless. After struggling to turn it for a while, the Norwegians ignore the instructions and turn it clockwise. The valve opens. When they gain access to the rescue trunk on the 21st of August, 10 days after the incident, it's full of water. Once the inner hatch is open, a small pocket of air streams out of the ninth compartment. The salvage divers measure the oxygen levels in compartment 9 at 7%. They lower a camera in and see the bodies of the 23 sailors. Following this discovery, the fate of the crew is clear and the Russian Navy is forced to make an announcement. First, Mikhail Motsak, the chief of staff of the Russian Northern Fleet, breaks the news that Kursk is found flooded and all hands have died. Admiral Popov apologizes to the family members of Kursk's crew, stating, forgive me for not bringing back your boys. 
Despite some arrangements being made to recover the bodies of the sailors, the families ask that no further lives are risked. Wednesday the 23rd of August 2000 is declared a day of mourning. Vladimir Putin posthumously awards the Hero of Russia title to Kursk's commander, and all other crew members are awarded the Order of Courage. Two Dutch salvage companies, Smits International and Mammut, are contracted to raise Kursk. This is the largest operation of its kind at an estimated cost of $65 million. In addition to the normal hazards involved in any salvage operation at depth, there are added dangers associated with Kursk. Radiation from the nuclear reactors poses a potential threat. And 17 out of the 24 torpedoes are unaccounted for. The first concern is the bow. This is the most likely location of any unexploded torpedoes. The salvage team decide to remove it from the rest of the wreck. They install hydraulic suction anchors in the seabed on either side of the bow. Then they run a large saw through the bow. This saw is made of high strength tungsten carbide. For 10 days, it draws back and forth across the bow until it breaks through. Next, they pull smaller sections of the wreck to the surface. A portion of the sonar system's dome is recovered along with a piece of torpedo tube. Now, the 24,000 ton Giant 4 sails into place. The 130 meter semi submersible pontoon is designed to transport large objects like oil rigs on top of her deck. To transport Kursk, it's altered to hold a sling underneath. A hole is cut in Giant 4's hull in order for the submarine's sail to fit through. Saddles are installed that are specifically shaped to Kursk's hull. Holes are cut into the barge to install 120 miles of lifting cables. A computer program is created to compensate for the weather by automatically adjusting 26 hydraulic strand jacks. A diving platform named Mayo is deployed with saturation dive teams who remain in saturation for the four-week operation. Using water jets, they cut holes into the hull and weld rings in place. The divers attach cables to each ring. On the 8th of October, 14 months after the incident, the strand jacks take up the cables and raise Kursk until it's secured underneath Giant 4. The final destination of the wreck is Roslakovo shipyard in Murmansk. Two pontoons are floated underneath Giant 4 to raise it 20 meters higher to enable it to enter the floating dry dock with Kursk still slung below. The pontoons are inflated further to raise Giant 4 enough to detach Kursk and sail out of the dry dock. In September 2002, the bow section is blown up on the seabed along with any unexploded torpedoes. This is to ensure the wreck site is safe from explosives and prevent any foreign governments from recovering Russian secrets. When the dummy torpedo is salvaged, investigations show that it failed in the center near the site of a critical weld. Once the sailors' bodies are removed and the hull thoroughly investigated, the remainder of the ship is transported to Seda Bay on the northern Kala Peninsula. The two nuclear reactors are defueled and the ship cut up for scrap. Recognizing the hazard of the HTP torpedoes, the Russian Navy orders all of them removed from service. Russia begins participating in NATO search and rescue exercises in 2011. The Russian Navy also doubles the number of deep sea divers trained each year from 20 to 40.